Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Braun, and I'm the curator at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And I am delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation by Teresa Saccord, a celebrated Penobscot um, educator, geologist, and artist. Born in Portland, Teresa studied geology at the University of Southern Maine, and later earned her Master's of Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison before returning as the staff geologist for the Penobscot Nation in the 1980s. While based on Indian Island, Teresa began to learn Penobscot basket weaving from tribal elder Madeline Tomer Shea. Under Shea's apprenticeship for five years, Teresa came into her own as an artist. It was during this time that she also realized how endangered basket making traditions were among members of the Wabanaki Confederacy which today include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations who are indigenous to the place we now call Maine, as well as portions of the Canadian Maritimes. The realization prompted Teresa to become a full-time artist and in 1992 to found the Maine Indian Basket, Make Basket Makers Alliance, or MEBA. During her 21 years of leadership, MEBA helped revive and revitalize basket making among the Wabanaki who, alongside Teresa, are increasingly being positioned on the national stage for their artistry, creativity, and self-expression. She has received many honors for her work in education, including the National Heritage Fellowship Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Endowment for the Arts in 2016, the First People Fund's Community Spirit Award in 2009, and the prize for creativity in rural life presented by the Women's Fund World Summit Foundation at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. And she was the first United States citizen to receive this honor. Teresa has also been widely recognized for her own artistic achievements, receiving several first place awards at the Herd Guild Indian Fair and Market in Phoenix, Arizona, and the famed Santa Fe Indian Market in Santa Fe, New Mexico, among many others. She was named a 2011 Traditional Arts Fellow for Maine and the 2013 Maine Craft Artist of the Year. Her work is held in the collection of many institutions, including the Portland Museum of Art, the Colby College Museum of Art, the Hood Museum, the Farnsworth Art Museum, Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and most recently, the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Indeed, we are thrilled to include a new basket by Teresa in the exhibition Threads, Artists Weave Their Worlds, which opened on October 12th and will run through October 2024. If you have not already been next door to view Teresa's work in person, I highly encourage you to do so. And we're open late this evening so you could head over after the talk. It was an honor for the museum to support Teresa's work on this basket, which she'll talk about this afternoon. We are lucky to now include her among the many artists whose work we collect, display, and recognize for its artistic and historical significance. Welcoming Teresa Saccord here to Bowdoin College this afternoon is truly a privilege. Here at Bowdoin, we acknowledge that the college is located on the ancestral homelands of the Wabanaki, who have deep and enduring relationships with Maine's land and waterways. We acknowledge the painful legacy of the region's colonial history and commit to better understanding it while also celebrating the vibrancy of Native American cultures and working to build a more inclusive community. It is in the spirit of deep respect and friendship that I ask you to join me in welcoming Teresa Saccord to the stage this afternoon. Well, thank you, Casey, and thank you all for coming. Really honored and pleased to see all of you here today. Um, I also want to thank um, Frank and Anne Goodyear for the opportunity to uh, weave a special basket for the museum, which I'll, I'll show in a minute. I usually start my presentations, um, and especially this being an artist talk, with um, the family business card. This is my great grandfather's great-great-grandfather's business card from the late 1800s. This is some art from that work. Um, so just showing like this long connection with the uh, selling of the baskets. Before I get into my own art though, I do want to talk about the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance work because um, many of you know about the resurgence in Wabanaki basketry in the last few years 
And a lot of it had to do with this collective effort of basket makers from the four federally recognized tribes here, the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, um, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot, where we set out to save our own endangered art of ash and sweetgrass basketry in 1993, and we did. Over um, a 20-year period, we were able to lower the average age of basket makers from 63 to 40, and we increased numbers from around 55 founding members to about 150 basket makers today, so really um, a, a long-term <laughs> long effort. And some of you know other basket makers like Jeremy Frey, Sarah Sock Beeson, uh, Gio Sock Toma, and they are really direct uh, results of um, that work that many of us um, you know, really um, put into place. This is, for example, this is the late um, Angela Barnes, who's Passamaquoddy, and she's teaching her granddaughter here in the traditional arts apprenticeship program that we implemented with funding um, and support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Maine Arts Commission. And this is now um, one of the longest running traditional arts apprenticeship programs in the nation, where a master you know, basket maker teaches someone one-on-one -on -one in their tribal community. And these, this mentoring used to be going on, um, of course, naturally on the reservation communities here in Maine, but that um, link had largely been broken. And so we were able to reconnect those threads and um, you know, bring back this work, um, you know, hence the success. But I also want to not forget to point out that um, an alum here, Francis Soctoma, is someone who is now running that program through her um, nonprofit organization called Nabizan out of um, Central Maine. So it still lives on. This is a photo illustrating the um, tribal community basketry workshops that we also put into place. And again, these are like 20 something year programs. And this is where as many as 20 of us from all four tribes would go and teach um, as many as 80 community members how to make baskets on the reservation in an entire weekend. So we would teach everything from pounding of the ash log to braiding the sweetgrass and all different styles of baskets, potato baskets, um, the ancient pack baskets that the men wear and use still today in hunting and fishing, and then these what are so-called fancy baskets. And I, this is so long ago, I've forgotten the Passamaquoddy boy's name. So, there's a long history of selling baskets in Maine. Um, I think the, some of the earliest recorded writings I've seen um, talk about around 1820, around statehood. This is 1860. These are Penobscot basket makers selling um, baskets on Mount Kineo in you know, the island in Moosehead Lake. And um, there's some interesting things about this photo. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed is like a lot of the old, there are many, many postcards of basket makers selling in Maine, um, antique postcards, and often it's the women doing the selling. So I found that really interesting, you know, this, this indigenous sovereignty and um, expression, you know, of, of female entrepreneurship as early as, you know, the 1800s. And um, it's hard to see in this photo, but some of the baskets are truly <laughs> remarkable. And one thing that I think is amazing is that the man on the left is holding a small toy birch bark canoe, which is, of course, something we're renowned for the the birch bark canoes here in Maine. Um, the sad thing to me about this when I was putting this presentation together is that this is only 100 years after the Spencer Phipps proclamation, the lieutenant governor of Massachusetts who declared a bounty on the head of every um, male, um, female, and child Penobscot member of my tribe in 1755. So this is only 100 years later. And um, you know, again, you see the people's resilience. Um, one thing that's, that's, that's interesting, too, is this basket tent. And I'll talk more about that. But um, there's going to be an exhibition coming up that, at the Farnsworth that kind of celebrates the selling of the basket tents all up and down the main coast and in um, the area of the Farnsworth, in particular, Lincolnville Beach, that I'm working on and co-curating with Sarah Sockbees. And this is my great-grandmother selling her baskets in 1953. <coughs> on the Penobscot Reservation, so um, that's Indian Island, the island in the Penobscot River. 
And um, lucky enough to inherited all of the wooden forms and tools that um, she used to weave her baskets on. So you can see like the barrel shapes and um, even the, there's an overexposed basket that, okay, I should try to use the pointer here. It's a little bit shaky because I guess I'm nervous, but that is um, a woven stationary box, which I realized was woven on the same wooden form that I wove this sturgeon basket or the Pizakas basket upstairs on. So that, or next door. And so that's, that was pretty cool. <coughs> um, this is <laughs> selling in the Santa Fe Indian market in August. And I, I put this in to just show things have not changed that much on how we sell our baskets. <laughs> you know, it's still like the table. And these are a couple of my friends. The woman to my right won the best of basketry in the, in the market this year. Remarkable basket maker and Arapaho friend of mine. These are my wooden forms in my house. And um, again, I'll show the, uh, the sturgeon form is here. And um, the barrel basket is kind of hard to see over in the dark corner here, but it was really great that my friend Jeremy Frey, who I'll talk about too, um, made scaled down versions of that barrel basket for me to weave my own art on. And what's really great is like um, in the antique basket record in Maine, of which I can tell you is really quite large, there are antique Wabanaki baskets in a lot of places in Maine and, uh, and, and outside of Maine as well. Um, we can see our family styles and weaves represented. And so the barrel is a particular form that my family is known for among others. Um, these are some of the wooden gauges. I just wanted to show some of the tools. I don't know how many people know much about the process. These are date well back into the 1800s and they're really well worn. I don't actually use these anymore. These are um, handed down in my family. And it's kind of hard to see, but these are little, whoops, I went too far. These are little um, watch spring or clock spring blades. You can kind of see it on that one the best. And of course, these are hard to get now because we don't um, find that. You have to go to antique shops to find um, watch spring and clock spring and they, they're sharpened and they provide like the best strength and the best um, material for cutting the wood. Our baskets are made from wood from the ash tree, not the bark, the wood. And then, um, you know, we harvest sweet grass as opposed to braid. And what's really um, beautiful is that the Gauge on the right there is so fine that we're, we basically can sew with the wood at that point. It's about 1 16th of an inch wide. Ash is really the silk of the basket woods is what I say when people ask me like other tribes like Cherokees weave with oak and that's really um, a different uh, wood and it, it doesn't, uh, it's not as pliable and flexible. And, it, and also, when you see the baskets, and I'll show in a minute, like Jeremy Frey weaves, we can see through the wood when he's making those points and those really high artistic style pieces. Oh, and I just, I do love the face on that gauge in the, in the middle too. I think that's, you know, some kind of amazing spirit in that piece. And I wish I could talk to the maker who'd be, you know, one of my ancestors, probably great, great. Uh, this is a replica of a glove box I made. And so a lot of my early work, I have to say, I've been a basket maker for 30 years, so 35 years. So for 30 years, I've been doing really traditional looking baskets that had a lot to do with, you know, my great grandmother's legacy and, and wooden forms. And I always tell people to, like, for the longest time, we we're all weaving our grandparents' baskets. Until, and I'll show you again, when this next generation came along who totally transformed the art form. But this would look almost identical to one that my great grandmother wove in um, you know, her time period and on her same wooden form. And, but you know, it, it, it appealed to some judges at the Santa Fe Mute Market, which for those of you who don't know, that's the largest juried Native American art market in the world. And there are a thousand of us, 1,000 artists selling and showing and competing for prizes in that market. That'll be significant when I talk about Jeremy. Um, this is a sewing basket that I made for a commission. And um, I put the photo of my great grandmother inside um, and it's backed with this blue velvet because the collectors who asked me to weave this piece for them um, they weren't interested in having me weave like the sewing notions that usually come with these baskets. A lot of you have probably seen the antique sewing baskets where 
There are pin cushions and needle cases and you know, even weave covers for scissors. And so I wanted to use that same blue velvet that I would have used in those little tiny sewing notions and, and put it in. So I backed the back of that photo. And that's my great grandmother basically holding this, the basket that she would have woven on the same wooden form that I wove this basket on. And then the other thing I want to point out is um, I used cedar bark in this wood, in this piece, in this basket, introducing a third material. Um, a lot of us have known about the emerald ash borer beetle coming, and we've known about it for 20 years when it first um, hit the United States, and we've, we've you know, sadly waited for it. So now it's here and it's killing all of the ash trees in Maine. And so um, we started, you know, experimenting with new materials and this was my way to try to conserve, you know, the ash wood that I have and introduce a third material. I just like the texture too. That is my great grandfather, great, great grandfather and uh, the business card. And this, again, some of my, you know, work um, not too long ago. And what's interesting is the location too of his business on Indian Island, of course, but also a coastal location in New London, Connecticut, where the basket makers went you know, pretty far and wide to sell their baskets. Um, I know they were selling baskets in Boston in the 1700s, and then in the 1800s up and down the coast of Maine, the Pullman Spring House, um, you know, a lot of different locations, Bar Harbor. Um, there are a number of historic homes in Bar Harbor that still hold multiple generations of, of baskets in those houses. And that's one of the reasons we implemented a large annual art market there, in, in addition to the apprenticeships and workshops that we were doing, because we wanted to recreate, you know, this kind of fame that, you know, the earlier Wabanaki basket makers had. And um, this is, uh, I, like I said, my great great grandfather is wearing the um, collar and cuffs of a tribal chief. And that's a replica of a basket from like 1910 because the basket makers and the people selling the art would have these on their tables, kind of like a calling card. So uh, about five or six years ago, I started, a lot of us, you know, weave these woven corns, you've seen them. And actually I've seen them from the late 1800s in museums. And so these aren't really new, but I really wanted to start to work on kind of capturing some traditional ecological knowledge and I was impressed with um, some of the young farmers at the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, where um, the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance has had a tent in the Common Ground Fair for almost 30 years. And um, so the middle piece is um, kind of commemorative of the Abenaki rose corn. And then the one on the right is a callus flint corn. And these are ancient indigenous corns that were grown here in Maine. And of course, the other one is because I do market and sell in the West is a Hopi blue corn. This is a um, Azakwaha, um, an acorn, and I just made this as fall for the Common Ground Fair. And I, I'd include it to show, like, um, I'm starting to use um, the um, indigenous language in my basket work because. I, my work in the last five years, I think, has become more meaningful to me in that um, I wanted to reflect like the value systems of the things that the tribes are addressing now. And I've been in language classes um, for the last two and a half years, and so um, I'm trying to learn um, actually the Passamaquoddy language. It's a little complicated because I'm a Penobscot, but sadly, um, the teacher that Casey mentioned, um, my basket teacher, would later become known when she passed away in 1988 as the last person born speaking the Penobscot language. And now there's been a revival in the Penobscot language and there are speakers. Again, it really almost, it really wasn't lost, but there aren't first language speakers. There are people who learn. Unlike the Passamaquoddy tribe where there are still, um, um, there's, there's probably two or 300 um, speakers of the Passamaquoddy language. And something that's in their favor is that the Maliseets still speak their language conversationally in the households on the reservations in Canada. And it's almost an identical language to the Passamaquoddy language. So that's a language I'm learning. It's really similar to Penobscot, but I'm looking for my cousin now who's, who's learning, a, a learner with me. And, it's, and there are enough differences that I'd get really confused if I tried to learn both at once. 
This is um, Sudek work um, for the ocean and actually more specifically the Gulf of Maine. And being the science, you know, kind of nerd that I still am deep down, um, you know, as Casey mentioned, I, I did work for my tribe right after the Maine Indian land claim settlement where um, the Penobscot Nation and the Passamaquoddy tribe together um, reacquired 300,000 acres of land in Maine out of the, the settlement. And so literally the tribal administrator at my tribe called up the, um, all the people working in natural resources. I happen to be the only geologist, lawyers, business people, and we all came to work for our tribe in the early 1980s. Um, and so I just um, was really intrigued by this work that's been going on at Bigelow Laboratory for a few years. And um, the green and blue on the left side of this 4L scale, which I guess is a um, scale that was developed in Switzerland in like 1912, is still being used. And the researchers, this recently retired Dr. Balch at Bigelow Lab um, in Booth Bay, has been doing these transects for like the last 25 years across the Gulf of Maine, uh, measuring a number of um, parameters, including, you know, of course, temperature and so do and, and water color and phytoplankton growth. And so it's way more complicated than I'm going to explain it. But basically, from what I understand, the blue and the green on the left side of the scale constitute a healthy ocean. And so I really wanted to kind of mirror that work. And it was surprising because um, this piece is also in the Passages exhibition at the Portland Museum of Art, where I'm also a trustee and um, actually the curators here, <laughs> Rainy Mize. Thank you, Rainy, for coming. And um, they, the people at Bigelow Lab saw it and they sent it all over Twitter to show that they were so excited that, you know, a citizen, scientists had, you know, been really, artists had been really inspired by their work because I think, I can't quote him exactly, but he said, you know, we, we do this work for years and we wonder if anyone's listening or caring. And I guess that's sadly kind of the story about climate change that now we're starting to listen, I hope. Oh, this is my cousin at the Passages exhibition. Um, she's here in the room and she's, she's been a long time apprentice with me and basket maker and language learner. And so she's on the left in the Passages exhibition um, with my piece and then also a piece she made and a piece that um, her grandmother, who is my great grandmother, made. And I think it's really cool that we're represented together. My great grandmother caught us posthumously, but I really applaud the PMA for doing this kind of work in bringing, you know, the indigenous art and worldview into the museum. Um, those two baskets that are on either side of mine actually are woven on um, uh, B and M baked bean jars, which was very traditional <laughs> when I when I was growing up. I remember one of our jobs. So I did grow up in South Portland, and the trek to the reservation was like 150 miles, and um, I remember run, being the one to run back into the house to get the bag of jars that we were saving for Mimi, our great grandmother, because she needed them for her weaving. And I had an uncle who carried that on for me and saved those for me. And now they're increasingly harder to get. Um, and the photo on the right is, is kind of unrelated, but it's the same cousin and me. And, um, and another cousin actually here, Lila, we're doing um, language work. And so I was also in 2021 awarded a Loose Indigenous Knowledge Fellowship from the Henry Luce Foundation and um, administered through First Nations Development Institute. And this work is a multi-year project to try to bring back the weaving in the tribal language, which is, which is really difficult, but the language of basketry, those particular terms for our tools, for um, the way we did things is, is fast disappearing. And so I was really concerned about that. Again, kind of how I saw the basketry itself disappearing. I'm now seeing that the use of language as a lot of the elders like um, Frances Sogtomer, for example, I mean, her, her grandmother's obituary was in the New York Times. She was a remarkable, remarkable culture bearer. And there was an exhibition of her and her work Molly Neptune Parker here on campus a few years ago. And um, she was the president, longtime president of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. And one of her um, goals too in, in that work was to try to 
um, preserve the tribal languages and, and also these, like I said, these terms that are falling into disuse. And so, um, and then my teacher said, and this is true about, I guess, any language, you really can't be proficient in a, in a cultural practice in um, your culture unless you're practicing it in your language. And so it's a, it's a tall order. It's been a couple of years now. We're still working on it. But we also just taught at a language immersion camp at Cobbs Cook Institute a couple of weeks ago. This is a small class at the Hudson Museum a couple of years ago. So this is some more of my own art. And again, getting into more here in 2023, my concerns about climate change and being inspired you know, by my own value system and the issues that are important to me. So um, I saw the poster coming up. I participate in the Common Ground Ferry every year. And this poster was made by a young woman called, an artist called Rebecca Lowell. And she's doing a lot of great work in Maine. To, and so she's the poster artist for 2023, but she's doing a lot of great work in Maine to um, bring awareness to the loss of the milkweed habitat, which endangers the monarchs as they do their um, migration. And so um, Weepinoxen Naga Amagas is the um, pronunciation of that. And I love this word Weepinoxen because it means um, feather shoe. So it refers to that seed pod. And see what I'm saying with the language is so beautiful and descriptive. So it's referring, the word, the Passamaquoddy word for milkweed is the feather shoe. And um, so my piece here on the right is about an eight inch barrel. So one of those scaled down versions. And I hope you can see it's evoking, you know, the butterflies alighting on the, um, you know, milkweed, but also see the um, little caterpillar kind of nod to the caterpillar here in the striping. These are just smaller versions. I, I, you know, I kind of turn myself, you know, it's, it's so interesting and great to be involved in museums now. I'm a governor at the um, governing board of the Colby College Museum of Art and a, a trustee of the PMA, I think I said. And, um, you know, being invited into museum spaces now and our art is really kind of new. And um, so I'm always looking at the marketing side, you know, being an Indian market artist is kind of how I refer to myself. And so these are smaller versions, kind of more affordable. That would be like a three inch size on the left. And this one's more like four inch kind of diameter. Well, this is the um, other end of the Subig scale. So Subig two and um, I noticed this summer that the um, researchers are finding this huge algal bloom. And it's, I guess it's really alarming. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than any other water body almost on Earth, is, uh, so they say. And so, um, and this is, this is like, like terribly disturbing to see that water in a jar from here, the Gulf of Maine, which we, you know, all of us kind of in our delusional way sometimes think of Maine as, you know, this pristine place in, in so many ways. So um, yeah, this is the piece that shows kind of what happens and going on to the other side of the color scale where the ocean isn't as healthy anymore. And so this is the piece that's here, my um, Pizakas sturgeon basket. And um, again, I guess, um, what I wanted to show here was, um, you know, unfortunately, that was my that was my dead model, uh, and, it, and it took me a few weeks this summer to try to figure out how to show those scoots. This is kind of a unique weave. It's like a fold over. I was talking with Jeremy Frey about it, and it's not one that we've seen often in recent times in our ash basketry here in Maine. But um, the fish is really interesting in that um, the tribal hunters cannot penetrate those scoots or scales as they're called. And so I wanted to show um, the ancestral presence of the Penobscots hunting this fish using birch bark torches at night by birch bark canoe. And so this, this basket really commemorates the return of the sturgeon, the recent return of the Atlantic sturgeon to the Penobscot River. Um, let's see what else there. 
Well, and the other thing that I that I liked about it, again, the sad part, but my father was a lobsterman out of Scarborough for 30 years. And so when I would go in his boat, the sturgeon would jump in front of the boat because, again, they were excited by the sound of the motor. Is again, the smaller version of the sturgeon. And I did just have a Bowdoin alum ask about the larger version, and I think, I think they're settling on the smaller version. <laughs> and then the thing is, too, I guess, you know, as a commission piece, I really wouldn't want to make, you know, another one that's identical, that's really special. And I guess I want to share, too, like this special commission here at Bowdoin gave me and gives an artist something that you don't realize you really need is the time and the space you know, to be creative and to bring out thoughts and ideas and experiment. Um, I, I, I will say that that's you know, probably my best work. And um, it took me 35 years to get there. But I so appreciate the museum for understanding that because again, I'm usually weaving on deadlines for going to markets, the Heard Museum market, the Santa Fe, the next one coming up is the um, market at the Hudson Museum in December. I wanted to show a little bit, and I hope this is okay, about other museums that I work with. Um, of course, I shared that I'm on the governing board at the Colby Museum. I've been there for since uh, about 2017. And, um, What's important for me to show here is how, you know, things are changing really fast and artists and art is being, you know, really embraced, indigenous art in museums. Um, but there's kind of a right way and a not so right way. And I think the museums in their way are really going about it the right way here in Maine. Um, this exhibition engaged an indigenous curator, a Wabanaki curator, Jennifer Neptune, and in 2019, this was the first exhibition ever of Wabanaki art in a fine art museum. Previously, our work had been shown in ethnographic museums, and we had some baskets, four of us, in the Portland Biennial in 2015. But the, the doors to museums like this were closed to basket makers for a variety of reasons. Whoops, <laughs> getting too excited there. You know, perhaps I'm sure space was an issue and not a lot of knowledge about the art. And um, so it, it's great that these spaces are open now. One thing that's been really amazing, like I said, is the use of tribal languages. So tribal members are walking into these museums and not just seeing the land acknowledgement, which is really important, but seeing um, that the value system of the museum matches the value system of the tribal communities, whether it's the transfer of intergenerational knowledge or the ecological um, concerns that we have, which were portrayed in the Wiwinigan. And again, the, the heavy use of um, language in this exhibition was really important. And it really set the stage for the one that's on exhibition now, the painted exhibit, which I'll show some photos of in a few minutes. This is Jeremy Frey's work as well as mine on the right. You can see the barrel shape and you know how I talked about the use of cedar bark. Um, Jeremy's piece, I believe, was the first time that um, a museum had commissioned a major work by a Wabanaki artist, and the, the price was $20,000, and that was astounding in 2019 for a basket maker. Um, the inset here is kind of hard to see, but that's um, inlaid with um, porcupine quills, dyed porcupine quills that are sewed into the birch bark. So a tremendous amount of work on this. But, but I would say today, after I'll show you a couple of photos of his work now and what he's been doing, um, the price tag would be well north of that now, just four years later, which is his career has really taken off. And, and a lot of it does have to do with collaborations with museums and museum engagement. This is Sarah Sockbeeson's piece on the right, which is, I think, also really astounding. And this is in the current exhibition now, Painted Our Bodies, Hearts, and Village. And it's kind of hard to encapsulate it, but in, it's, in a nutshell, it's basically at the museum, we took the Tao Society paintings, which are, you know, around 100 years old. And, you know, the um, director asked me as an advisor and also a governor, you know, how should we, a couple of years ago, how should we address this? You know, these paintings need to be reinstalled, et cetera. 
And I said, well, you need to bring in a lot of Pueblos from the Southwest, which, which they did. And so there's a Pueblo co-curator, a whole tribal council of advisors on this exhibition. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's truly spectacular. It's, it's well worth the trip to Waterville and it's up through um, June of 2024. But just to show too that we needed to maintain our uh, basket presence in these exhibitions as well. Um, Sarah wove this piece of all recycled and found materials. So there's plastic in this. And, you know, she's in her late 30s. She's the generation that is going to deal with the absolute loss of the ash trees where there won't be any wood. And this wood is actually sacred to the tribes in Maine in that we trace our creation from this tree. One of our origin stories talks about Gluskabe, the culture hero, shooting an arrow into the ash tree. And from this tree came the first people. And this was recorded in the 1800s. Um, you know, and, and written into a book. So it's not just the oral history. And so the loss of that tree is going to be really devastating to um, the tribal people well beyond the loss of the basket making material. But this, I think, is just a remarkable basket. I have to have a little bit of bragging in that Sarah was actually my apprentice's apprentice. But again, she represents that generation of basket makers that we brought forward through the work. And I love how, too, knowing that this is a Pueblo exhibition that she used turquoise in the finial, but that's a distinctly um, Penobscot <laughs> double curve motif design. And again, it's, a, it's, it's hard to show it in a photo. This is a, a piece called Indian on the Edge by a, a friend of mine, Roxanne Swenzel, and I think we're in the process of acquiring this. Um, it's kind of in communication here with the Tao Society painting. Uh, entitled The Scout, and I, I forgot the artist. But again, these are paintings from 100 years ago that are being you know, put in context now with um, contemporary Pueblo work. And I, I really like this piece mostly for um, the teaching component that, that it has in that um, Roxanne, did, she's a really renowned uh, Pueblo sculptor woman, and she didn't um, speak until she was about six years old. And so she communicated through drawings and through clay. And I think of um, my son with autism who grew up in the Waterville school system. I think of school kids coming through, you know, with communication issues and being showed that, you know, you can communicate through art. There are many ways to communicate through art. And uh, so, I, I, and I just, I think it's a really great piece. Um, these are really astounding pieces as well. This is um, the designer of the exhibition is a really renowned um, sculptor and potter, Virgil Ortiz from the Cochiti Pueblo. And um, this is one of the warriors. If anybody's been watching PBS on Native America, they've had, they've had the story of the, the warrior component <laughs> one. And that's one of the warriors from the 1680 Pueblo revolt. And that's a sculpture uh, that we acquired, that we commissioned for the um, exhibition. And so these artists are like really important and have not been in these spaces, particularly in the East before. Um, important women artists and important indigenous artists as well. Um, Virgil's designs, it's kind of hard to see in this one here, but are also on the walls. And a number of these are, some are contemporized, but a number of them are very traditional. Um, Pueblo designs and represent their worldview and, and their narrative and their value system. And so that's another reason this work is so important. This is a Tony Abeda, and he's a really renowned um, Taos Pueblo painter. And um, I believe that was acquired by Peter and Paula Lunder for the museum. And so again, seeing it in context with this 100-year-old Taos Society painting, um, one of the things that I said, though, because I was working with the curator and some of the artists, was that um, we just found it really curious that this school of painting in Taos drew all of these Eastern painters. And some of it, I think, is, of course, the climate and the whole painting school thing, which is really important because there's Skowhegan School here in Maine. But they really overlooked the invisible Native Americans in the backyard. You know, the Wabanaki artists and the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois artists, so these painters from New York and Boston and Philadelphia are going to paint the vanishing race in the West. And our Pueblo friends really, you know, found that quite interesting. Because I was trying to share, like, 
what it's like to be in this territory as indigenous artists and the descendants of you know, these people all these hundreds of years later and be still, you know, largely invisible, like I said, not being in these spaces and, um, and not being painted either, you know. So what was also super cool was that some of the models in the Tao Society paintings from 100 years ago, some of the advisors on the project and artists were actually descendants of the same models in those paintings. So there's so many really cool little nuances in this exhibition. I hope I'm not going on too long about it. Um, another important artist is Jodi um, Naranjo, and um, this is her work. And she really was one of the, it's, it's not shown well on this piece of work, but she was really one of the first Pueblo artists to start painting contemporary messages and art artistry on her pots. And so, Again, this piece was important to me for us to collect. We got a chance to get it through my affiliation. It was an auction at First People's Fund a couple of years ago. And um, she's just a really important matriarch in the Santa Clara Pueblo. And hopefully, you know, people will learn about the artists who are important in the Western world and in the indigenous world, you know, different artists that, and that's one of the missions at the Portland Museum of Art as well, is to try to have better representation in our collections. This is me and Jeremy at his show at Karma Gallery. And so you'll recognize this piece, which is upstairs, his piece called Permanence. And, um, what to say about him, I mean, um, I guess he said I can share. Some of his individual baskets are selling for $100,000 for a main Indian basket, which, I mean, we never saw him coming when we founded this organization in 1993. It was mostly elderly basket makers and me, and you know, I was the youngest person, the only person under 50, almost, and um, could, and again, we were weaving our grandparents' baskets. And you saw that I have been weaving my grandparents' baskets for the last 30 years. And so Jeremy came and completely transformed the tradition. He has so many firsts in that um, he was the first, um, I, I keep saying this, and I, I think there might have been one other but he won the top prize in the Santa Fe Indian market, again, competing with 999 of us. And that's astounding. He was the first person, I think, east of the Mississippi River to win that prize, you know, hailing from the easternmost point in the continental United States. And he might have been, I think he was the first basket maker ever to win at the Santa Fe Indian market. And this is the largest juried Native American art show in the world. And after that, there were just, there have been so many other firsts. He, he won the top prize in the Herd Guild Indian Fair and Market that same year, and only one other person had done that in history. And that show is, you know, probably about 50 years old at the time he did that. He was the United States Artist Fellow in 2010. And we've been friends for like, you know, more than 20 years. And I, I like to say I was his professional development mentor. You know, <laughs> I don't think I taught him, and I didn't. His mother did, but I wrote the grants that funded the program that helped his mother learn to make basket making in the traditional arts apprenticeship program. And then she taught him at a really difficult period in his life when he was really struggling to, to remain sober and straight. And it was just like kind of fortuitous that we had all this work going with the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. And I will say too, even in, you know, um, my um, tribal community, Jeremy's Passamaquoddy, but you'll still, you would still hear the old basket makers say, you know, make baskets. Like, you know, when times are hard, you need money. And I, I've said that to my son when he was out of money in college. And, but just like kind of focusing his great, great creativity and artistry. I mean, I, I, um, I don't think there's a, a lot of us that are gonna be selling baskets in that price range because you know his artistry and kind of engineering skills in these pieces is amazing. He still goes down and cuts down the tree in the woods and hand pounds the log. Uh, now he's got my son <laughs> hand pounding it with him. My son is actually apprenticing with him now, which is, you know, I couldn't think of a greater way to kind of quote unquote pay me back for helping him find some of his opportunities. 
But now, um, this was his solo show at Karma Gallery in New York. Um, and he's the, in the East Village, and he's the first Wabanaki artist to be represented by a gallery to have a solo show. Um, the book on the right here is something that Ramey and I have worked many hours on. I think we're done, but um, that's coming out in advance of the first solo show of a Wabanaki artist in May at the Portland Museum of Art in May 2024. I'm super, super proud of that. And so um, many firsts, and I guess I'll start bragging about him. This is my son, Caleb. <laughs> yeah, he wanted me to put this photo in. This is the year that he won a first and I won a second. <laughs> and that's actually at the Heard Museum. That would look familiar to Frank and Anne. And um, actually, Frank's father was the director at the Heard um, Museum for many years. And there were these really great basket weavers gatherings. And so we actually sent basket makers like Jeremy Frey, his wife Ganessa, Sarah Sogbeeson, a number of um, younger generation basket makers out into these basket weavers gatherings in um, Arizona, Hawaii, and then out into the national Indian art markets. Because we knew that they had to see um, other role models like themselves, like especially in May, you know, they had to see other younger indigenous artists who um, you know, were really passionate about their work and who were really good at it as well. And so this is my son Caleb today, who's, um, like I said, pounding the log for Jeremy. <laughs> well, that's almost all I have. I sent around this card, which is our next market, about promoting. There'll be a number of basket makers there at the um, Hudson Museum at the University of Maine. The only problem with that one, as you all know, if there's a little bit of snow on the interstate that, that makes it like almost a no-go, it's icy. Um, and then this is um, a piece I just made this month just for something for fun. And I think um, we have a small video to show. Yeah, a five minute video that actually features Jeremy. It was just done by the main office of tourism. I'm gonna gear that up. It, it, it shows like the process of basketry and kind of for those who don't know, actually shows them going into the woods. For me, being an artist in Maine is a connection to the forest. My art is so grounded to the forest. Everything that I make comes from the forest. Wabanaki basketry was born in the forest in Maine. That feeling and that connection to your environment and to your place goes to the core of who you are and what you're capable of. You know, when I say I speak basketry, that's because I've dedicated my life to weaving. Wabanaki weaving is damn close to Maine's oldest art form. It's one of the languages my tribe speaks, and I am one of the carriers of that language. I am a weaver from the Passamaquoddy Nation. When I say Wabanaki, I'm actually referring to all the indigenous people of Maine. We weave with black ash, and sweet grass, which is a grass that grows along the coast. We've been making baskets for thousands of years. And I come from a family of weavers that goes back generations. We have two styles of basketry, fancy baskets and utility baskets. Utility baskets are pretty self-explanatory. That's the original basket. I make what are referred to as fancy baskets. It's a style I developed based on our traditional baskets. Mine are a very contemporary version. They're decorated with curls, braided materials, colors, and they're much finer weave. When you see Wabanaki fancy baskets, generally you haven't seen anything like that before. It wasn't until my early 20s that I started weaving 
for a time it was on the brink of being lost, just like many other traditions. I've spent my whole career trying to redefine what ash can be. There's a very small community of weavers that harvest their own material. And you can count them on one hand. See this dimple right there? It's a disease, and this is quilting. You can't go into the woods and cut down a tree and make a basket. It's not like that. You have to know where ash grows, what healthy ash looks like. Some ash trees are brittle. Some are too thin. Some are too thick. Some have branches everywhere, so the grain isn't straight. This is a core that I took out of an ash tree. That's 20 years of growth. If the growth rings are thick enough to make baskets with, then I'll gamble and cut it down and see what it looks like. Sometimes I'll be in spaces like museums where they have the white gloves and they're handling the works. And I will get a little chuckle thinking, if you only knew how many times I hit that basket. I think it's amazing that there's that much brutal trauma in something so delicate. My work is heavily influenced by nature. A lot of the shapes that I use come from nature. All of my quill work is images of different animals or places in nature. These pieces do not exist without the main forests. There has been times where I've invented something amazing and I've seen it years later in a museum from 100 years ago. It feels like I have this direct connection to my ancestors, like somehow they've told me what can be done. And it's, um, it's pretty powerful. Everything has changed for Native people but we still hold on to certain cultural aspects of who we are. So if no one does it, it's just a damn sad loss. This is something that my people made and it's beautiful. Yeah, just a, a couple of things about that that I wanted to remember too is that when I said we didn't see Jeremy coming, um, men were not weaving those artistic fancy baskets. Men at that time were weaving the baskets his grandfather made, which were fish scale baskets, which kind of almost look, a lot of people use them for laundry baskets. The Passamaquoddy tribe in particular was making those in large quantities um, for the um, fish scale business, used in nail polish and paint and things. And then also his great-grandfather was really well known for those pack baskets that fit on your back. And I, and I was gonna bring a photo, but you never saw men when I was learning and growing up making these artistic baskets. And so in so many ways, you just didn't see him coming. And then the other thing I thought was really cool is that he's using that, that core to do the dendrochronology that foresters use, whereas the traditional way would be to cut a wedge in the tree which actually kind of damages a tree. But I don't know if you noticed too how tiny um, 20 years of growth is. And so it's gonna be really devastating because these trees grow very slowly and there's not many of them and very select habitat. And um, you know, it takes 60 years, 60 years to grow a tree that is harvestable for an, um, a basket and so. Yeah, a lot to it. A lot of traditional ecological knowledge involved there. That has been handed down to him through his uncle, thankfully. And um, about 10 years ago, maybe it was closer to 15 now, we um, captured a lot of knowledge from the Maliseet, Micmac, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot basket makers who still knew how to evaluate the ha habitat and harvest the ash, because it's a little different in each tribe then we have that recorded and it's in file at the Smithsonian in case we have to leave this information behind for future generations. 
So that's the other thing you see in indigenous art is always a responsibility. Like we saw that with the Pueblo exhibition, you know, it's, it's, it's not really like mainstream artists who are maybe doing their own work in their own studio. Like we saw the Pueblos come in to Colby and they really want to send a message as a community and educate and share the beauty of Pueblo artistry. And it's kind of the same with Wabanaki basketry. You know, everybody talks about we, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a collective art form, which I think makes it really unique. So open for any questions. I'm just gonna make a quick announcement. So we have a few minutes for questions. I'm just gonna ask that if anyone has a question to ask, you come down to the microphone um, so that everyone in the room can hear you and also so that our recording in the back picks up your question. So um, open the floor to questions and Teresa, feel free to direct. Okay, yeah, and there's another mic over there too. Sorry about that. Oh yeah, sure, Anne. Teresa, thank you for an amazing talk. It was just beautiful. Um, and I love the way in which you were able to um, share with us something of the tradition of these baskets as well as some really exciting opportunities um, to see um, examples of this work on view um, here at Bowdoin, at Colby. We're so excited for the upcoming show um, at the Portland Museum um, next spring. So, so much exciting, um, so many exciting things happening. And it makes me think a little bit about an element of your presentation that I wondered if you could expand upon a little bit. And it's the relationship between tradition and contemporary circumstances. And so I loved, for example, hearing about the, um, the bean jars mm -hmm. um, that, that were used when you were growing up. Um, and of course that factory is now closed. So right. it's interesting to think about how those were being used. It's exciting, although I really um, mourn the um, uh, arrival of the emerald um, ash borer. That's, that's devastating, but it's still empowering and exciting to think about new materials um, that are being incorporated into baskets. And it's my understanding that fancy baskets themselves um, may have emerged um, in part through contact that um, Wabanaki artists were having with Europeans in this mm -hmm. part of the world. So I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about this really interesting intersection between um, tradition and circumstances that lead to the evolution of um, forms and opportunities, um, perhaps for new forms of expression sure. to develop. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think like you said, um, you know, the, the tradition had some big changes from utilitarian to this more artistic fancy basket style when people came and started purchasing baskets for their homes and they were, you know, especially in Bar Harbor for the big houses, you know, having sewing baskets and picnic baskets and, you know, the whole range of, there were even baskets for napkin rings and powder puffs and, you know, waste baskets. It was, they wove, and then plastic came and that, that all changed. And then the art form was really flagging, you know, when I started learning in the late 80s. And so I think, um, you know, we were just trying to capture some of that traditional knowledge that was still going on and, um, and then these younger basket makers. I mean, it, I credit a lot to Jeremy, but people like Sarah Sockbeeson were also, you know, starting to paint on the tops of baskets and expressing herself. She's an artist also, had been an artist, a painter. And so I, I would say really credit that generation. And there was no way they could make a living at this unless they didn't make changes. You know, you're, you're not going to make a living selling baskets for $30, which is what they were selling for in 1993. And so I think, I think they're really the, the heroes of that contemporary transformation. And then the thing I saw with Sarah too was she had been experimenting with alternative materials. I mean, that piece that she made, I still say, is so remarkable. And she had been experimenting with those um, materials for about 10 years. I would see her, you know, making these little things and, and they look terrible sometimes, you know. And so now, 10 years later, 
Um, she's seeing that she has a future as a basket maker without using ash and, you know, kind of making that story maybe that sweetly sad part about losing the wood. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I just think, um, you know, it, it really is a credit to that generation. And then perhaps, like you said, the next transformation will be weaving. And I know basket makers um, in the West who are weaving with archival paper. And my, my good, dear, late friend, Shan Goshorn, used to weave, you know, words and messages and all kinds of activism in her paper baskets. And she was a phenomenon. So those influences, too. I will share, too, like the finials on Jeremy's baskets here and here. Um, I don't know if you could see the woven detail on those. That came right from us sending him to these large Hawaiian basket weavers gatherings in Hawaii. And um, his first exposure was with other male weavers in, in Hawaiian culture who were weaving these warrior armbands in that same style. In uh, 2006, um, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival was held there and it featured 80 Native North American basket makers. And um, we sent five from the main Indian basket makers lines from three different generations. And so they were networking with Hawaiians and he's still credit. I mean, his Hawaiian friend, Mike Naupi still said he owes him a little bit of commission on each basket for <laughs> teaching him how to weave those because that complete, no one had done that on our, on our finial covers before either. So there's probably more, you know, innovation than I realized. I forgot to point out too, I think the name of the press is, is it Greenline Press? Rizzoli. For Jer? Rizzoli. Rizzoli? Oh, okay. For this um, book. And so you might want to look it up. And it's entitled Woven that Ramey and I worked on. <laughs> We're still working on some other things. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Are there other questions? Um, great, this is great, and we, my wife and I have seen baskets at various museums here and there, but it's, it's nice to see it getting so much more exposure. But I'm, I want to go back to your, the, the ash trees mm -hmm. and how they're getting destroyed by the ash borer. Um, and global warming is moving different species north to Maine, right. and species in Maine are moving north to Canada. Uh, it'll take a long time, but are there other species besides ash, which is a great flexible mm -hmm. wood, um, that are coming along or that are being explored that are come from the Mid-Atlantics or the, even Connecticut, you know, where there's a different group of species? Is, is ash absolutely the only thing that, as yeah. opposed, or is it going to be plastic at some point? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question, and no, that is the sad reality, and there's nothing like the ash wood. That, I mean, again, um, like I'm showing you, we're, we're sewing with it. I think Jeremy weaves um, 132nd on some of his finer, finer work, which I don't see here from this distance. So maybe some of these weavers are like 132nd of an inch, and you really can't do that with any other wood. Just the way it grows with the growth rings, the way we can split it and split it. We split the growth rings multiple times and literally thinner than this paper. You can see your fingers through it when he's making all these points, which sometimes take 100 hours on those baskets. And so sadly, no, there really isn't a substitute for the ash. Well, we're going to get those scientists to work on that. Right, yeah. Get some use. <laughs> well, and we did work with the US Forest Service, the tribal foresters, and um, some foresters from New York State. We've been working on it for about 20 years. And so the, th the, the things that you're seeing, like quarantine and stuff, are kind of the only answers. I do know that the state has released wasps, which is a particular, it's called Cirxis, I think. And it's a particular wasp that goes after the beetles. But I remember being on a conference call about 10 years ago, and a lot of tribal chiefs were on there from the eastern US, and they were all against it. You know, just culturally, they were totally opposed to that method of introducing another invasive to take care of this invasive. I mean, um, I'm just trying to think what else. Um, well, and another thing you brought up of all the invasive plants is crowding out the sweetgrass beds that we harvest the grass at the coast. And access is another big problem because of 
all the people moving here and they have no understanding of the historic. I mean, a lot of the places where they had these basket tents like Lincolnville Beach, which is gonna be featured in the Farnsworth exhibition, the Lincolnville Beach tent and the famous family, the Shea family that made baskets and sold there. Those tents were placed there because people, Penobscot people were historically traveling to the coast and prehistorically, and then picking sweet grass there and making baskets on site, harvesting shellfish. Really the Indian Island village is our winter village. And so unfortunately, the sweet grass is getting crowded out by the invasive, a lot of invasive grasses. So it's getting tough out there. <laughs> you know, I think I'll be fine for my lifetime. You know, that's, I guess, how we all do the math, right? How is climate change going to affect us? But I do feel for my son and the other generations. And, but I mean, you have to think that, you know, there will be a resurgence at some point with the trees. It's just that we're at the northern extent, kind of the northern range, and they already aren't a very healthy, long-living tree. Now they're really interesting species. There are a lot of ash trees in Maine, but not many are the black or brown ash. I don't know why people in Maine, or the only people who call it brown ash <laughs> locally, but uh, there are not a lot of, of them to begin with. And so the emerald ash borer beetle is, is killing all of the ash trees. So everybody will see a change in the skylines and things around, particularly central Maine has a lot of ash. I've seen it in Connecticut where my set, one of my set daughters lives. Any other questions? Sorry. Chatting. Really appreciate the audience today. This is great. I just have oh, to one last one. <laughs> yes. I can't help myself. Um, thank you so much, Teresa. This is amazing. And I just, um, if we're talking about different species and, you know, this amazing intersection of art and traditional ecological knowledge and science in your work, um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more with your sturgeon basket, how that is actually celebrating one of those returns or a resurgence in some of the sturgeon population after, you know, some um, challenges. So I just love to hear, I love how that basket operates as like a portrait of this fish to some extent, this homage to it. And anyway, anything else you'd like to share about okay. like your thought process there and that amazing story uh, for that species? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I thought I kind of invented, you know, the art to represent the return of the Atlantic sturgeon to the Penobscot River, and I noticed that James Francis had already done an incredible painting. <laughs> and then there were people um, in, um, is it, I, I, how, how to say this, the Penobscot word is Pasigasawamkeg. And so there are people in Belfast near that river who have done murals down there. And so I'm not the only one, but you know, due to dam removals mainly, that makes it possible for the fish now to get up to the Penobscot you know, as far as the northern tide range is 60 miles where Indian Island is. So, um, yeah, I was just really inspired by that, kind of a resilient story. And I thought the scales would look really good on, on there, and they did. You know, I kind of almost saw the weed first and thought this reminds me of, like, scales. And then, um, you know, was doing some reading and research. But thanks. Yeah, there's... There's some, there's some other ideas that are brewing now, too, for sure. Did you want to just share that publishing company in case people want to find Jeremy's book? Sorry, I make you get up again. Of course. Um, yeah, so the uh, upcoming um, catalog, which Teresa and I co-edited, is called Jeremy Frey Woven, and it's mm -hmm. co-published by Rizzoli Electa and uh, the Portland Museum of Art, and it'll be available. I think it's available for pre-sale now and in April, formally. You know. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> You just pre-ordered? Okay, awesome. Okay, I'm going to tell Jeremy I need a commission on that. Yeah, seriously. Sale. And Teresa has the lead essay, so it's a treat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of it is about, you know, kind of our journey. I mean, you never know where things are going to take you. And I, I must say I'm immensely proud of the next generation of basket makers. And my son finds it, my 32-year-old son finds himself with, you know, being really interested in the art, always interested in, you know, being Native American. And now he has a, a career that he's embarking upon working with such a master as Jeremy. I mean, couldn't have imagined a great opportunity. And I think he's going to be pounding some of those ash logs too. <laughs> yeah, he needs that young 32-year-old. Well, thanks again, everybody. Really appreciate it. <laughs>